Hello, everyone. I'm Cherry and George at Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, on behalf of my fellow editors at Academia SG and our co-conveners of uh, this evening's event, uh, Nanyang Technological University's School of Social Sciences, uh, welcome to our Singapore Studies Junior Scholar Seminar. Uh, this is a series that Academia SG launched earlier this month as part of our mission to promote uh, research on Singapore. Uh, it's meant to showcase some of the outstanding PhD students and postdoctoral scholars around the world who are engaged in fascinating Singapore-focused work across various disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, we're delighted that so many established academics have instantly warmed to this new initiative and accepted our invitation to show their support um, to our junior scholars, either as co-conveners or as discussants. Our discussion today is Professor Vinita Sinha, uh, Head of Department of Sociology at the National University of Singapore. None of this would be worthwhile, of course, if we didn't also have this stream of wonderful junior scholars uh, whose work demands to be noticed and nurtured. Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Paul Victor Patnaden, a doctoral researcher at NTU's School of Social Sciences, where he works with Andy Ho, Associate Professor of Psychology. Uh, Paul specializes in holistic, palliative, and end-of-life care, uh, life and death education, and psychosocial interventions and therapies. Over to you, Paul. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming down. Um, so let me just share my screen here real quick, and we can get started. <laughs> okay, uh, is that clear for everyone? Can everyone see that, right? Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Paul Victor Patinaden. Uh, like uh, Prof Charin said, that I am, I am a, a doctoral researcher as well as a PhD candidate at the School of Social Sciences uh, Psychology Program at NTU. And uh, before I start, I would like to just say, um, I do have a really long list of thank yous actually. So uh, yeah, so let me just get that out of the way. So thank you so much to Academia SG for setting this whole thing up and for giving uh, early career researchers such as myself uh, a little bit of a voice um, and to present our findings. Uh, thank you also to Prof. Uh, Cherry George for his uh, so much effort that he's put into this, the logistics and uh, you know all of this. Uh, thank you also to my respondent, Prof. Vinita Sinha as well. Looking forward to a discussion later. Uh, my wonderful supervisor, mentor, uh, Professor Andy Ho Hao Yen from the School of Social Sciences as well. Team Arch, you guys are wonderful. I see a couple of you here and friends, family, everyone who's attended, and students as well. I see a few familiar faces uh, over there. Hi, guys. Uh, one special group that I would like to thank are the curious as well, because I feel that you guys are the soul of academia, right, you know, and research. Uh, just that simple curiosity that drove you here today. Um, I would like to dedicate uh, this uh, presentation to the wonderful families, the patients and the families that uh, my team and I have worked with as well. So um, without any further ado, let's start. Um, so today I'll be presenting to you a part of my thesis called I Aim What I Ate, the Food for Life and Palliation Model, or the FLIP model, uh, for understanding the lived experiences of nutritional assimilation, or rather eating, uh, among Sing Singaporean palliative care patients as well as their families. Right. Um, so I'll try and keep the, the, the whole presentation of, as slides off as possible, because I know some of you are looking through your tiny little phones as well. So uh, Try and treat it like a podcast. So, like, yeah, you know, uh, that's you can go about and do your stuff as well. And I'll just sort of speak to you. Um, so, I'm only going to refer to the slide like this once. So, if you look at it right now, you see a picture of a uh, photograph of uh, Montien Bunma, Vietnamese artist, uh, his art installation that was at the National Gallery of Singapore. Now, this is called The Pleasure of Being, Crying, Dying, and Eating which I think sews everything up uh, quite nicely about what we are going to be speaking about today. So uh, again, thank you so much for uh, joining me this evening. So let's start right at the beginning. Uh, Singapore is going through something called, that the media likes to call the silver tsunami. I haven't heard that term in a couple of years, but it's still there, it's moving around. Uh, this is mainly because due to uh, our rapidly aging population as well. So the Singapore Longitudinal Aging Studies, uh, the largest cohort studies of its kind, actually uh, found that nine in 10 older adults face some kind of chronic condition. So, uh, you know, things like um, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancers, and stuff like that. 
And about 20% of these people face psycho, psycho, psychological problems. So depression, anxiety, uh, dementia, cognitive decline, and so on and so forth. We can expect the demand for health and social care to surge over the next couple of years. And as such, palliative and end-of-life care sh must, should be ready to meet this surge, right? So what then is palliative care? Well, palliative care is simply, uh, it, it does come from the Latin word palliare, which means to cloak. So really that kind of holistic care. And the WHO uh, really looks at palliative care as dealing not just with patients, but also with families as well. And not just looking at pain, but other psychosocial, spiritual issues as well. Singapore is by no means a stranger to palliative care. We set up the National uh, Strategy for Palliative Care in 2012, and this was revised quite recently in 2015. Uh, we brought in Advanced Care Planning, or ACP, under the moniker of Living Matters. Uh, this was in 2011. So uh, we took a program from Michigan called Respecting Choices and sort of made it uh, um, a bit more local. Right, so ACP, uh, if you don't know, it's kind of like a medical decision-making process where you have like a next of kin who will be your healthcare spokesperson. You get to make all the decisions that you want in the event that you are unable to do so, right? So uh, if you're thinking of uh, doing this, a lot of acute care settings, um, hospitals, all offer ACP services as well. Uh, we do rank 12 among 80 different countries over the quality of death. So where uh, the kind of decisions we choose with regards to our passing, where we want to die, uh, what kind of care we, we receive at the end of life, and so on and so forth. Um, Singapore also is at that, that, that <clears throat> very important crux, that confluence where hospice palliative care is sort of integrated into the mainstream hospitalization, uh, the mainstream hospitals and care institutions as well. So at uh, most major hospitals, you either see a palliative care department or at least a couple of palliative care specialists um, working there as well. Now, you also see palliation make its sort of rounds in the media. So this was uh, a newspaper article from 2019, uh, which talks about Singapore's uh, wonderful work in palliative care. However, and this is a quote from a patient that I used to work with, um, so uh, she had this to say, I don't like the new meds, love. You know, they make me feel one kind. I woke up at 3 a.m. the other day to drink coffee because I was hungry. And that is something I've never done before. Uh, the pain is better, but my routine is all over the place. I don't feel normal, right? And yes, so Singapore's palliative care does parallel the global trend in that it is still a little bit highly medically oriented. Uh, my colleagues who work in the palliative care setting here are trying to sort of move into more holistic care, but of course, there are a lot of systemic issues, you know, this takes a lot of time, uh, effort, energy as well, right? So really the focus is sometimes mostly on pain and symptom management, uh, like the fentanyl patch that you see over here. Uh, pain is often reduced, but often the cost of consciousness, right? So psychosocial, spiritual needs of these patients often go unmet. There's also a lot of stigma and apprehension about palliative care in Singapore. Um, Raymond Ng, a wonderful physician at Tan Tok Seng, said it very nicely in, a, in an interview uh, that death is still seen as a very dirty word, right? So when I tell people I'm a thanatologist, uh, I study death, dying, grief, and bereavement, uh, the first question is always like, oh, why? The second thing they always tell me is, is there, that's so weird, is there such a thing? And the last thing they, they, they always tell me is, okay, yeah, get out of my Uber or my Grab, no, just, just kidding. Yeah, so it's always like surprise or like this very solemn kind of curiosity that uh, I always receive, right? And so unfortunately, the physical deterioration uh, that these patients face, their symptom distress, as well as the existential pain that, you know, they know that my journey is coming to an end can fracture their sense of dignity uh, and leave them at eternity's gate, uh, the painting you see here by Vincent van Gogh. And so, um, you know, uh, one uh, other patient I was talking to said that, you know, very simply, it feels like I'm sliding off a mirror. And that is such an important visceral metaphor uh, that really does have pain that's natural very nicely. And so this undermined dignity can cause depression, hopelessness, anxiety, a whole host of psychological problems, uh, increased suicidality with uh, patients, uh, feelings of being a burden, as well as overall poorer quality of life. Right. So uh, under the guidance and referencing the work of uh, Associate Professor Andy Ho Hao Yen, uh, my team and I, together with uh, Prof Ho, came up with something called the Family Dignity Intervention that we ran as a randomized control trial. 
So uh, that's just a fancy stat talk that we had a treatment option and a control option that we compared and see which one did better, right? So why, what does the FDI comprise of uh, and why did we do it? Mostly it was uh, that we were looking for a way to really reduce the suffering and achieve a sense of hope and meaning for patients at the end of life. So patients and families. Uh, because in Singapore, if you talk to any physician, they always tell you, we don't just treat the patient, we treat the family as well. And more, sometimes more so the family than the patient, right? Uh, FDI was really developed with an emphasis to cultivate these continuing bonds uh, that patients were having and really get them to achieve, uh, you know, this kind of meaning reconstruction in their own lives as well as with their family members. Uh, we use a combination of reminiscence, narrative and dignity therapies. So all these therapies are commonly done in the West as well. And we really hope to have created a supportive platform for patients and families to say, uh, thank you, I love you, you know, I'm sorry, and to really fortify familial bonds with them. Um, we also hope that uh, it created a platform where they were comfortable to pass on any lessons, transcendental values, traditions, and stuff like that uh, across uh, their, their familial generation. So 91 patients and families journeyed with us through the FDI process. And what happens during FDI is uh, um, myself like, or facilitator, so me or one member of my team, um, uh, we go down, we meet the family members. Uh, we have kind of like an hour, hour and a half long discussion uh, where we ask them questions like, oh, you know, what's your favorite memory? Uh, what are some things you've taught each other? What are your hopes and dreams for the future? And all of this is recorded. And then the facilitator goes back, transcribes all of this in verbatim and then um, sort of recreates this into a kind of like a mini book, like a story of the patient and their family's life. Uh, a little autobiography, if you will, that we call the legacy document. So this is a cover of a legacy document. So uh, for this family, the patient really loved to sing, right? And his favorite song was What a Wonderful World. And uh, he decided to call his life story simply that, What a Wonderful World. And so FDI, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide uh, because this is really not the, the key focus, but FDI did uh, see a lot of good stuff happen. For all you stats inclined people, um, there we did do non-paramedic testing. So this was because, you know, uh, uh, patients and families are going through that kind of stuff. It's a little bit hard. So the psychometrica uh, will obviously kind of be skewed, right, towards the negative sometimes. Uh, but for patients, we did see greater meaning, greater hope, uh, you know, greater social support. For caregivers, we saw lower stress, lower depressive symptoms after the FDI intervention was done with them. Over time, for patients, we saw um, you know, increase in positive readiness. So really for them to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, to remember happy times. For family caregivers, we saw an increase in meaning making. So um, how their duty and obligation of care became more than that. Uh, it wasn't just filial piety anymore. It became filial compassion, right? And they sort of were able to understand all of the, everything sort of came together for them, right? Uh, having gone through the intervention. Now, looking through all the stories, something very curious started to come up. And uh, this uh, was the same patient you met before. And this just organically appeared out of the blue, uh, out of nowhere. And she had this to say, I like to eat, like until now. That's why even this morning, I went to Geylang. So Geylang's a suburb that's famous for uh, having good food and some other things, uh, you know, to makan. So despite not feeling too good, my appetite not so good as well, I tried to eat. And it was very, very curious. And I, I went to my prof and I told him, prof, I think we have something here. And he's like, okay, Paul, take it, run with it. Go and see what we find. And so I did. And I realized that food can be such a major source of dignity and empowerment for patients, right? A lot of our patients and family members started organically talking about food. Like no one asked, right? None of the questions had anything to do with food, but it just started coming up. And what I realized was that I was carefully listening to their food voices, right? So what then is a food voice? It's not singing into your broccoli. Um, so this was actually a still from a video, a very bad music video that, that made its rounds a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's not that, right? So what is a food voice? The term was coined by researcher Hawk Lawson in 1998. And food voice is basically how we think about our experience food, okay? Quite simply, uh, how we use food as the channel for expression of meaning, uh, meaning that was both fluid, meaning that was dynamic as well. Food voices talk about our identities, our cultural ethnic identities, our values and our beliefs. Uh, do we eat kosher food? Do we eat a halal food? Are we compassionately vegan? Um, are we vegetarian until we've 
got a few beers in and then we've reached for that bacon cheeseburger. So what's our food identity, right? Uh, it's also memories, uh, relationships, feelings towards others. Uh, do I only go and eat chicken rice with this particular family member? Uh, is there a group of friends that I always go to Haiti Lao with? You know, what's, what's the, the, the special memories with regards to food? Uh, food also talks so much about our life stories and our histories. Uh, I remember when I was in secondary school, we had a bit of pocket money. Uh, we would go to the McDonald's across from school and then we would buy french fries and ice cream and because that's all we could afford, right? And then one, someone would always, this weird kid would always put the chili sauce into the ice cream and mix it around and then dip the french fries in it. Like culinary genius or mad scientist, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not the weird kid if, you were, if you're thinking that. Uh, food also talks to us so much about our public and private lives. So um, the pictures, the fancy Instagram photos we take of food during SG Restaurant Week, which is coming up, I think soon, so make your bookings now. Um, all those pictures are so different from the monstrosity we create in the kitchen, you know, that burnt piece of uh, extra burnt cheesecake or, you know, that, 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 that Maggie Goring pile with five eggs and three Valley Chef hot dogs sliced into it. So our public and private food lives are so very different as well. And I think no one said it better than our former Minister of Trade and Industry, Mr. Lim Hung Kiang, Mr. Lim Hung Kiang. And he said, well, we spend a lot of time eating and thinking about food. Even when we are eating, we are already thinking about the next meal. And this is so, so Singaporean, right, to do so. Uh, to the best knowledge of my team and I, there are currently no qualitative efforts to understand the role of food or food-based experiences at the end of life uh, for Singaporeans. And food obviously is so important to us. And I uh, here's <laughs> so this cracks me up every time. So this is a screenshot that my sister who lives in Melbourne uh, had with her Bakwa dealer. Okay, she didn't call him Bakwa dealer, the Bakwa sales person, right? Uh, so she was buying Bakwa over Chinese New Year. And the first thing she asked, oh, are you guys Singaporean? And he goes like, yes, I am. And she's like, yeah, that's great. And he instantly starts talking about food, right? Oh, I miss the oyster omelette in Singapore. And my sister goes, yeah, you know, I miss the fried Hokkien. So the first thing as Singaporeans in a foreign land, we talk about food. So if that, that is not proof of how intrinsic our food voice is, then I don't know what it is, right? And so really the point of our study today are, uh, that I want to present to you was really to understand the role of food and food experiences for Singaporean patients uh, at the end of life as well as their family. Because I have, their food voices are similar but very much more different from ours as well. And so what we did was that we took a subset of the qualitative data that we had, so all the wonderful stories that we collected, um, and we ran, uh, we, we did a constructivist phenomenological approach, right? We took that approach where we allowed the data to speak for itself. We built upon it. Uh, everything was audio rec recorded, transcribed in vivo and all that. Uh, and we did analysis-wise was a framework analysis. So we took the larger domain of food and then we did open axial selective coding uh, we use inductive deductive approaches to find a pattern response. So what is it that Singaporeans were saying? Singaporeans at the end of life specifically were saying about food. And we formed this into this tiny, this wonderful little model over here. So thank you to Mr. Chan Kinam for the original design of the model. And uh, this model actually has four major themes and three sub themes uh, each. So I'll be going through each one and each one will be supported by a quote from a patient uh, or family members, so you really get to see uh, the narratives that they are telling with regards to this model. And uh, well, the first uh, the, the first theme is really called uh, feeding identity and familial bond. So like we discussed, our food voices uh, form our identity and personhood, and it's also a very key means of connecting to family. So the first sub theme, food and self-definition, um, this really talks about how food starts, food voices start at a very young age. Uh, we start to develop them very, very young and they shape our lives throughout. And this is a quote from a, um, a patient and she had this to say, um, I love to eat mee kwa. I can eat two bowls. So for mee kwa, for those of you who don't know, uh, for, our, for our foreign friends, uh, it's kind of like a noodle dish that is sort of soupy and spicy. And it's just, it's a little bit hard to find these days actually. Uh, and she goes, I can eat two bowls. So um, when children finished the first bowl last time, they would not dare to ask for another one, choosing to sit down very quietly. Then my mother would say, ah, this one, I'm sure she wants another bowl. 
I will always go for a second bowl. I'm the only one in the family who, you know, loves to eat, what makan, ah, you know, uh, being a big eater. People would take one bowl, I would take two. And you really see how this was uh, her food voice, right? Oops. Uh, okay, so our second sub theme is uh, really uh, food and memory. So a lot of times, uh, food played a very special role in uh, people's lives, like, you know, memory wise. So this was sometimes during festivals. Uh, but for this patient, uh, he talked about his work at an international port. So he used to work um, in a seaport and he would go up on the ships every time and he would say, oh yeah, you know, uh, they would say to so the people on the ship, say, take whatever you want, put it in a plastic bag and take it away. And he goes like, oh, it's fresh food. I still remember his voice when he said this, fruits, chicken leg, cold cuts, ham, and all the food was really like from a hotel. So we looked forward to that. Some of the food we didn't understand how to eat. The first time I ate, what do you call it, caviar? I didn't like it. I didn't understand it. I didn't like it. Later on, after years, I got used to it. And as I got older, I got more comfortable eating these things. I learned how to eat oysters. Very nice time I had. Beautiful. So really, you see that fond tenderness with regards to food. Uh, we didn't always have happy stories, uh, happy memories. Sometimes, especially for our older patients and families, uh, finding food, uh, you know, uh, eating poverty was a huge uh, thing with regards to their early lives, especially for those who had survived the war. And uh, this uh, is an example of one patient who did. And he talked, to, uh, uh, he, uh, he, he had this to say. During that period, so during the war time, each household would cordon off a portion of the front of the house and say, okay, this is my plot of land. And so each family would try their best to plant whatever food they cook for daily consumption. We had tapioca, sweet potato, chilies, all of these food trees. So we had to make do like that. Sometimes we got ration cards. And we got a little bit of rations and that was how we survived during those times. So some families, the more resourceful ones maybe, they turned to hawkering. For my family at the time, I have no idea how we managed to get an income really. So really you see, you know, that kind of uh, resilience, you know, that kind of adaptability uh, with regards to food. So the second theme is liminal subsistence in illness transition. So as patients fell sick or as they developed a chronic condition that restricted their diet, food became simply nutrition sometimes. Um, it changed the way they, they thought about uh, eating and uh, you know meal time as well. So a lot of times food is just now the survival option. But uh, very, very, uh, but sometimes, you know, there are small pockets at times uh, where food becomes the smallest possible pleasure for them. So all of these colorful experiences that they had become dull and a lot of restrictions, right, when you fall ill. And usually the family is also required to rethink, reorganize meals and meal prep as well, which can be quite difficult. So this patient, uh, this was the same patient who talked about uh, his cold cuts and ham on the ship. And this is what he had to say. Uh, in the past, I used to eat all the different types of hot, spicy, curry food and all of that. But now because of this particular cancer problem, I can't quite eat those foods. And I can't eat the amount I used to eat before. At one point, it was just porridge, porridge, porridge. So at tedium, right? Porridge until you're sick and tired of it. Uh, for those patients and family members, or for those patients who used to cook a lot, right? Uh, not being able to be in the kitchen was like a part of them was missing. They don't recognize themselves in the mirror. Uh, so this patient actually lamented, what has happened to me? Why am I like this now? Why am I no longer as capable as I used to be? Why am I so slow when I want to bake or cook? I know I was capable of doing so many things when I was younger, but now I'm slowing down in everything that I do. So really you hear that point and then uh, lamentation in her voice. And like I mentioned before, sometimes uh, a simple meal can be super empowering and really provide a sense of the ordinary to a life that is constantly and consistently changing, uh, degrading because of a, a really tough illness, right? And uh, this caregiver uh, talked about her husband uh, and their trips to go and visit uh, the doctors. And she said, then after his medical checkup, we always tend to think about where we want to go makan because he loves food. So I prefer to go out with him now, whatever he wants to eat. When we are still able to walk, we take a cab and we go and makan. And we will hold hands like this. So cute, right? If this is not couple goals, then yeah, you know, I don't know what it is. So wonderful to hear their story. Okay, so the next uh, part of the model is really how food extends from the present back into the past and into the future as well. So food becoming lineage, right? And the first thing, 
um, they, they, they we really see uh, really like what I mentioned before, the identities that transform over the lifespan. And the first thing we really see is all the, that kind of, whenever we talk about Singaporean food heritage, really that part of the cultural, ethnic identity, pride, tradition, ancestry, all of these big terms, right? And uh, this patient very proudly, she would talk about uh, how she used to, to how she learned all of her, her, her famous recipes from her mother-in-law. And she said, well, my husband is Javanese too, Padangi is Indonesian. His mother used to sell Padangi's rice and her restaurant used to be so packed during lunchtime. I learned from her and the recipes, I am balado. And then she talked about her husband, he loves ikan balado, terong balado and all of this stuff. So really that sort of pride and that I'm carrying on this uh, heritage. We also see the kitchen legacy, you know, personal legacies that were forged in fire in the chicken, uh, in the chicken. Okay, I must be getting hungry. Hungry in the kitchen, like right? with families bearing witness to the art. Um, so really, you sort of see uh, this caregiver talk about uh, her mother, and she goes like, she's known for quite a lot of dishes. The entire family loves to eat popia, right? Uh, which is a kind of spring roll. And when she cooks it, we ask everyone to come home and have it. And then she has a disclaimer: it's not the usual hakka version, you know, it's a Hokkien version. It's really tasty. And she complains there is so much work to do. She's not going to cook it the next time, but she still does it, even though she's ill, right? Because that is her legacy. And finally, we have kitchen wisdom. No, I, I think this is probably my favorite part of the model because uh, this is kind of like a, how food is used as like a means to pass on practical knowledge and sometimes also as a metaphor for life. So uh, with regards to this patient, she will always tell us that she was, um, you know, balancing, like really playing a balancing act with her husband and her daughter who had two very different personalities. And then I remember I asked her, so how do you handle this? How do you handle all the explosion that was happening in the house? And she goes with this glimmer and this wink in her eye, right? You know, this glint in her eye. She goes, ah, but sometimes you have to compromise and make a dish that everyone can eat. And it all comes down to whether you eat more of it or you eat less of it, right? So really as a means of passing on wisdom as well. The final theme I have is called compassionate nourishment. And because food is present at all stages of life, feeding and eating often symbolizes and showcases care. It holds a lot of symbolic and practical meaning uh, for people, for humans. Uh, for Singaporeans especially, uh, have you eaten? So uh, we, Vanita was talking about this uh, just now, right? Have you eaten is a common uh, expression, right? Uh, it's not just a greeting for us Singaporeans. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's an expression of empathic concern, right? Uh, have you eaten to the makan Chafabwe, right? You know, it, it goes beyond being a greeting. Um, so for this um, caregiver, so he talks about his mother and he, we asked him, so what's really like your, your, the deepest impression, the memory with the deepest impression? And the first thing he goes, yeah, you know, the memory with the deepest impression, my mom always worries that we will be hungry. She will always give me $2 and say, hey, quickly go and eat something. During your growing years, you shouldn't go hungry. When I was a student, there were times where it'd be late in the evening and I would not have had a meal yet. I'll call my mother and ask her if there's any food ready to eat at home. And she'll say, yeah, yeah, come back. There's a lot of food. Hurry home so you can eat. When I got home, I realized, but mom, there's no food on the table. Why didn't you say there was food ready? And she'll reply, there'll be food once I cook, right? So really, have you eaten? Uh, cooking uh, is physically demanding and time consuming. So labor and love is the next sub theme. Uh, it took my wife a pandemic to learn how to cook. And uh, now when I slave over something in the kitchen and I serve it to her, the thank you is a little bit more heartfelt, right? So I hope that when you're in the kitchen cooking for a loved one, that it's appreciated as such as well. Uh, and this patient uh, had this to say about his wife. So he said, well, every day she tries to have a different menu especially when I'm sick. She's thinking of different food and every day she's just asking me uh, just to be able to satisfy my palate. I'm slowly beginning to enjoy and taste all this food again, coming back to it. She can cook all different kinds of food. She also likes to make certain types of drinks, a mixture of drinks with avocado and all that in a concoction. She likes to experiment on me. So really the labor that the wife was putting in just so her husband could eat something that was tasty as well as was nutritious for him, right? 
And finally, uh, the final sub theme for the model uh, is called the table to bond. So food is definitely a means of bonding like we've discussed. And the table is this place of rest and very quiet dignity throughout the turmoil of illness, throughout all the roller coasters that happens through the, Ill through the illness journey. And uh, this patient said it very beautifully. He says uh, he recalls the time with his children when he was just newly diagnosed. And he said, well, sometimes you go to Changi Beach, just sit down, buy some food and eat. At that time, the children were all very small. Sometimes they see an ice cream seller. I'll just tell them, take the money and go and buy. We'll sit down, we'll eat and we'll be happy. I don't want to think about the stresses that I have. So really the table, the meal time as this means of solace, right? Okay, so I'm coming to the end uh, of my little presentation. So, I mean, with regards to research, it's nice that we come up with a model, we have the stories, but then how are we gonna do this, right? What are we gonna do with it? So um, my team and I, we recently developed, conceptualized and ran a virtual applied drama workshop for student nurses. So thank you to Nian Polly. Uh, some of you are here today as well. So we had 37 junior nurses. Um, go through this applied drama workshop based on the split model. And we really hope that this uh, would allow these nurses to practice empathic facilitation, right? To provide this kind of dignified, compassionate care that they were really, um, you know, holistically caring for the patient. You know, some of these uh, junior nurses, uh, they, 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 they mentioned that, oh, you know, I get tongue tied, you know, I don't know what to say, you know, uh, after the patient say, oh, the food, how's the food? Okay, oh, okay, you know, and then the conversation ends. So really the, the workshop helps them to sort of like, okay, yeah, use the flip model and sort of like, you know, continue on uh, the conversation. Okay, so tell me a bit more about it. You know, what, what is it that you like to eat? Uh, you know, what is it that you're craving for? Stuff like that. So um, we are still running the numbers. Uh, we are still writing out the manuscript, but uh, the workshop went uh, pretty well. And I, I'm glad that the, the, the nurses found it useful as well. Uh, I would like to sort of uh, use the flip model to incorporate into standing interventions as well. So really to springboard conversations into advanced care planning or medical directives. So all the difficult, tough medical decisions can all start with a have you eaten, right? So when I was working on the uh, National Advanced Care Planning Evaluation Project, when ACP first came into Singapore, um, I would talk to some of the facilitators and they would tell me that hey, you know, yeah, it's really hard for us to just walk in, walk into the, 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 the ward and then start talking about, oh, what kind of decisions do you want to make, you know, in case something goes wrong, uh, having built no rapport whatsoever. So really something as innocuous as food can be used as really this bridge between people. Uh, that's often my go-to, right? You know, if you want to talk to, you want to have a conversation with a taxi driver, which I do all the time, I just ask them, oh, uncle, where, where, do, you, where to eat, ah? Uh? Where to find the best prata or the best Hokkien meal or whatever, and they'll just jump at that. And you know, you can have such a wonderful conversation build up from that. Um, I also hope that, you know, similar to the FDIs for patients and families where food is such a big deal to them, uh, we can create a flip book of heritage recipes. So things based on the flip model. Uh, and this really can be used as a legacy building technique, a meaning reconstruction as well, similar to what the FBI did, uh, but more food related. And one of the things is I, I do hope my research can provide, in the, provide insight to key industry players for people and people who do end of life nutrition, right? We need to stop collapsing food options uh, for this group of people into uninspired survival options, right? So no patient I've talked to uh, has ever enjoyed this ensure nutrition shake, right? You know, uh, they hate the nutrition shake. They, they despise it. It's just like a chore for them. It makes them feel bloated. They don't like it, even though it's, you know, it's good for them. And I mean, like, look at the flavors. We have like vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, which frankly aren't very Asian flavors, right? And if we can have Kaya Toast beer, I mean, why not Kaya Toast something else for this group of people who definitely, you know, they, they, it, will, it will be good for them, you know, it, it, it'd be something nice to break the monotony of their, uh, of their nutrition during illness. Um, I also hope that the flip model can aid the bereaved with the grief work. So um, after the patient has passed on, uh, food voices are still so resonant, right? So rich uh, that they will continue on in the memories and in the lives of uh, the people that they've interacted with. 
So my team and I are currently drafting up a proposal for uh, a proposal for something known as a culinary grease intervention. So briefly, this is kind of like a cooking intervention that uh, is really geared towards helping uh, the bereaved with their grief work. So every week we'll have something from the plate model, cook a dish, talk to a facilitator, kind of like a group therapy kind of uh, situation over here. So fingers crossed, we'll see how that goes. And right before we end, uh, this is my last slide. I do want to share this uh, wonderful quote that sort of started me on this whole journey. Um, so really, um, I remember about 15 years ago when I was a really young kid, uh, I was watching the Food Network or Food Channel something, food, Asian Food Channel. And there was this older woman, right, who had recently lost her husband. And she said, she, she was telling her story and she said that, you know, um, every Friday evening I'll sit down uh, and I would, I would go into the kitchen, I'll cook my husband's favorite meal. I'll sit down at the veranda, look out into the garden, eat it and remember our time together. And she ended her story with this quote from Brilla Favron from The Physiology of Taste. And um, yeah, so this is a quote. Uh, the pleasure of the table belongs to all ages, to all conditions, to all countries and to all eras. It mingles with all other pleasures and remains at last to console us for their departure. So the next time you sit down and have that meal by yourself or with a loved one, uh, you know, with your loved ones, I really hope that you sort of pause a bit and savor that bite just uh, for a little bit longer, right? So that's all for me. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to get in touch, uh, this is my, uh, my team blog and my email address as well. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much, uh, Paul. Um, if anyone has questions for Paul, please uh, feel free to type them into the uh, group chat and uh, we should have time for uh, a few questions. But uh, before that, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Vinita Sinha to provide uh, a brief response to Paul's presentation. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, the editors of Academia SG for uh, coming up with this uh, wonderful new initiative to uh, you know, encourage interaction between junior scholars and, and uh, you know, more uh, senior figures in the field. And I think these are wonderful opportunities for mentoring and professional development. And I also in the same vein want to thank uh, Yuyan and Cherian for inviting me to be a discussant for Paul's uh, uh, research. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for, for allowing me to read your work uh, before you made the presentation. So I've had some um, time to reflect and, and uh, congratulations on the wonderful presentation, which was very clear and, and very, very uh, provocative. And I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions uh, about this. So let me just share in, in five minutes uh, my own thoughts on the subject. Um, I first of all want to commend you for uh, undertaking research on this topic. Uh, it's always very exciting to traverse uncharted territories and it's very clear that the focus in your research on uh, death and dying or, or the role of food or the place of food in uh, the lives of, of you know, patients who are terminally ill as well as their family members is work that has not been done. Uh, in, in the Singapore context specifically, but I suspect also more broadly elsewhere. Uh, so I think it's, it's really already a, a huge contribution in and of itself to actually conceive a research project on a, on a subject that has not received uh, very much scholarly attention. And you know, it's, it's also interesting to ask why that is the case, but perhaps that's for another moment. Um, I also want to applaud uh, your desire to reconceptualize uh, palliative care through this research. And, and I think it's, it's really interesting how you are talking about palliative care, which is really a very broad uh, and fundamental uh, sort of uh, challenge to the ways in which palliative care has predominantly been thought of, right? And I, I really like the focus on holism um, and you know, the fact that uh, you are seeking to provide a more holistic approach to the uh, understanding of palliative care and more importantly, translating that into practice. Um, in this context, one question I had was, you know, what is the place of uh, medical pluralism uh, in your research? Because uh, Singapore is a medically plural society, of course, uh, institutionally we function in a context 
um, where there's a dominant and hegemonic biomedical model of health alleviation. And, you know, the, the sort of understanding of palliative care in, in uh, managing uh, physiological and physical understandings of pain and suffering have really come from a kind of a biomedical model. Um, so given that Singapore society is medically plural, and I'm sure many of the patients and, and the families that you were talking to are actually, um, you know, partaking of different medical traditions, different healing traditions. And by the way, food occupies a very different register in the different healing options. For example, in Chinese medicine, food means something quite else. And, and of course, food also has healing properties, right? So in fact, in, in many uh, sort of non-biomedical approaches to healing, the dichotomy between food and medicine, in fact, disappears, right? And food uh, is not merely defined in terms of its nutritional value, but in fact, approached because of its healing properties as well. So I, I wanted to, to know a little bit about what is the place of uh, medical pluralism in your research, uh, in your effort to reconceptualize palliative care in more holistic terms, right? So, so that's the first sort of uh, response. Um, the second uh, kind of response I had really has to do with, uh, and I'm looking at the time and my God, it's really moving very quickly. Uh, the, the second sort of point I wanted to make really has to do with uh, your very insightful observation that the analysis you have provided of the data that, that you generated uh, through in-depth interviews shows, uh, you know, these four themes that you have very carefully <clears throat> presented to us. And I guess I wanted to say that many of the things that you have highlighted, particularly, uh, you know, themes one, um, two, uh, one, three, and four, uh, are really, you know, narratives with which we hear about food in general, right? So I guess my question is, you know, how different are the food voices uh, or not uh, of, of, of these uh, patients that you are talking about, uh, you know, in relation to other food voices that we hear in societies like Singapore, right? I mean, and I think it's important to ask what the notice of similarity and what the notice of difference suggests, right? So, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about that, you know, I mean, you sort of taking food voices as a generic category, but then you're also looking specifically at food voices of um, patients and then, you know, uh, I, I wanted to hear, you know, what was sort of distinct about these voices and, and also just to speak to the four themes that you've identified, which I think are very, very rich and will make for very interesting analysis. I also wanted to know a little bit about what is the kind of relative uh, emphasis uh, of each of these themes. And I'm not sure you have the data to say that, but, you know, so were all these four themes equally important in the narratives that you heard? or did some themes you know, get more attention? And, and I think this is where I sort of want to make a methodological point about using in vivo, which is very interesting. And of course it allows us to do coding and content analysis of qualitative data. But I think one of the things that in vivo doesn't actually allow us to do is to pay attention to the context, uh, particularly the context within the narrative where particular themes emerge as important, right? So I would actually encourage you to go back to the narratives and pay attention to those places where particular themes are emerging uh, to see whether you can say, you know, what are the trigger points which uh, bring about, you know, reminiscence of food, what are the trigger points that bring about more kind of, you know, uh, traumatic experiences of food, etc. So I wanted to, to hear your thoughts on sort of the relative, uh, you know, emphasis uh, or, or, you know, importance that is given to each of these four themes in the narratives. And then finally, and I'll stop after this, um, you know, I, as you know very well, you know, uh, not only is the food landscape and societies like Singapore dominated by the complex uh, social practices of consumption, but in fact, the academic discourse on food is overwhelmingly focused on consumption, right? Uh, this is something that all scholars of food studies in Singapore have noticed that, you know, uh, not only are people only interested in consumption, but, you know, and, and as a result of which they actually alienated from the processes of food production and food distribution and the inequities in that, or the unjustness of, justness of that. But 
Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in, in the context of your own particular research, um, what conceptual space is there for non-consumption, for not eating, in your research about dying and experiencing uh, you know, a kind of a terminal illness, right? Because as you know, there are sort of um, scenarios in which uh, patients can't or don't want to eat either because they don't have the capacity physiologically to swallow food or to, you know, chew it, etc. And also uh, very often, of course, loss of appetite because of the medications, right? So there are instances of medical force feeding, right, where food again is approached as in, in terms of its nutritional value and the idea that in order to keep uh, the body functioning physiologically and also to keep the mind uh, sort of alert uh, cognitively that it's really important uh, that nutrition is provided and in some places there is forced feeding uh, for example with anorexia patients that happens as well so I, so I wanted to know you know sort of what what would you think conceptually about the notion of non-eating within the context of your research. I mean, you've spoken uh, overwhelmingly about eating and how eating can be enhanced and how you know, it generates uh, feelings of normalcy and ordinariness, which are all very important and certainly go towards building identities and uh, a sense of uh, community and solidarity between family members. But uh, what, what about non-eating, right? Um, so so let, let me just stop uh, with those sort of three points and I look forward to a discussion. Thank you for, for an opportunity to engage with your work, Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Vinita. Okay, so uh, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, let me try to, uh, okay, so let's work backwards, right? Uh, Paul, uh, let, me, uh, let me interrupt you just to uh, yes. relieve your burden slightly. I mean, you've been uh, uh, given um, uh, you know, a, a response that is worthy of your future orals, right? So <laughs> that, that's, uh, and in the tradition of orals, it is perfectly okay to say, I'm going to take that on board. Thank you. Right? So, <laughs> so, so don't, don't feel you need to uh, answer uh, all the questions, also because mm -hmm. there are, there are uh, interesting points for discussion that have come in mm -hmm. from the audience. Uh, okay. So you feel free to be selective um, okay. about which particular um, intervention that you'd like to respond to. Um, sure. Can I suggest actually one of them uh, precisely because it actually resonates with something that uh, a member of the audience has asked. Uh, Don Lim mm -hmm. asks, uh, what about patients with a feeding tube or with mm -hmm. a non-swallowing impairment? Mm -hmm. uh, are any okay. of your interviewees in this category? And of course this mm -hmm. um, uh, matches what Benita has talked about in terms of non-consumption. You know, uh, mm -hmm. how does this work into your, uh, your your own thinking about the subject? Do you want to start there? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, probably primacy recency effects. So that's probably like the most recent thing uh, that was discussed. Uh, the non-consumption. So actually, if you take a look at uh, medical literature so, uh, with regards to uh, food at the end of life. So if you just Google Scholar food at the end of life a majority of the papers that you're going to find is with regard to do we withhold water, do we withhold food to an actively dying patient? So actively dying meaning, meaning like, you know, within the, like a few days to like a couple of hours, right? Uh, is this something that we want to do? Because we know that uh, giving them food and water is going to cause a lot of discomfort. It can cause a distension of bowel movements and all that kind of stuff, right, that happens. So a majority of the literature of the medical literature is really focused on the ethical principles of do we continue to feed someone who is actively dying, right? Um, so with regards to non-consumption, that's probably what most of academia is really looking at, uh, really at a very specific time point uh, for a very specific group of people uh, and really the ethicality of it all. So uh, Vinita actually did mention things like uh, force feeding during um, you know, uh, 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 mental disorders, uh, you know, uh, mental health issues such as like anorex anorexia and stuff like that. So really with regards to that, um, conceptually, I guess not eating would also be something that um, should be looked at, right, definitely. But again, uh, with regards to what questions can we ask surrounding this, what kind of data do we want to see? Uh, I think that would be an even more important question to start. So really starting from the very uh, front part of uh, the whole research paradigm. Uh, with regards to 
uh, patients that I've worked with, uh, we did have one patient with a feeding tube, but he generally um, really didn't like, you know, uh, mention much because we did converse with him through written work. So he didn't really mention uh, that specific, uh, eat, like the stress of eating uh, very much as well. So uh, again, uh, I do want to stress that uh, the data that you see here was really organically uh, conceived from uh, something completely not related to food at all. So now the questions we asked were really food related. This was the stuff that had come up while we were talking about really the key point here, which was dignity, right? And uh, I really do feel that yeah, that, that is kind of the, the, the main focus here with regards to uh, food and end of life, right? Dignity. So uh, I do thank you for that because uh, that, that, con that concept of non-consumption is also something that is very important. Uh, we do see drips and uh, drafts of it come out uh, with the narratives uh, that, you, that, that, that you see here. So patients complaining, you know, I don't want to eat uh, this because it tastes bad. I don't want to eat this because I'm just not interested in eating anymore. So then what is the really the, the psychosocial underpinning of what food means to them? So, and then how can we sort of like uh, um, use that negative food voice, right? That kind of, uh, um, that kind of like, 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 uh, like what I said, they haven't always been happy stories, right? Uh, how can we use that hardship? How can we reconceptualize it? How can we change it, spin it into a positive thing? How can we get them to make meaning out of this suffering that they are going through? So I think um, that really is the, the focus. So just plucking stuff out of the air, really that's, kind of like really the focus with regards to non-consumption. How can we really turn this non-consumption narrative into one of dignity uh, and one of positivity uh, with regards to uh, the end of life? Um, again, uh, I, I, there's something very interesting that uh, Prof. Vinita did say, which was the idea of medical pluralism. And I think that, yeah, you know, with regards to Ay Ayurvedic TCM treatment, there's always a lot of food involved, right? Can I eat this because it's heaty? Can I eat this because it's like cooling? and all this kind of stuff. We do see it uh, with uh, patients uh, at, at the end of life and their families as well. Uh, but often this is really, um, it really depends on how they view themselves within the medical sphere itself. So are they active participants uh, of the therapeutic alliance? You know, do they believe that, uh, do they hold more weight to this uh, traditional kind of values, uh, traditional kind of like, you know, healing properties of food? Uh, compared to the, the medication that they are receiving. So really like juggling that. And one thing that I have learned uh, from talking to so many different kinds of families is that every single one of them is unique. So there cannot really be a, a, a catch-all kind of umbrella, you know, uh, uh, an umbrella term or umbrella theme that will sort of help everyone. We do need to tailor all these things into very separate, unique stories. Right. So I think really with regards to palliation and end of life care is how can we help patients and families retell the stories of their suffering so that they can really empower themselves uh, and, you know, get them to live a dignified end stage of life. Right. So uh, food can be one of those things uh, that we can really use to empower uh, these patients and their families. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really feel that it, it is one tool, but uh, it is definitely not the only one. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to... I could just push you, yeah, if I could just push you on yeah. this point about uh, pluralism. And so on, at one level, there's this tension between uh, different medical traditions. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, uh, you know, since palliative care is holistic, there's also uh, interdisciplinary tension, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, uh, you know, what, what if your psychological research recommends mm -hmm. uh, a certain treatment, so to speak, that conflicts mm -hmm. with what the doctors uh, say mm -hmm. is nutritionally, nutritionally uh, harmful or beneficial? And I'm guessing that in most contexts, the doctors rule, right, <laughs> over, uh, over the softer uh, mm -hmm. uh, disciplines. And uh, related to this, um, we have uh, a comment from uh, Timothy Lowe, uh, mm -hmm. who points out that, uh, yeah, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, you have older folks who want to eat non-healthy stuff. And I quote, mm -hmm. my grandma has diabetes, <laughs> and so I've definitely seen her kids struggle with letting her eat whatever she wants, but also being concerned mm -hmm. with her cholesterol level, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you, um, uh, you know, uh, increase the, the, the sort of... The, um, 
uh, the, the priority given to um, uh, patients once over mm -hmm. when it's in clear violation of what mm -hmm. doctors said is, is good for them? Okay, um, okay, so that's a very interesting question. And uh, okay, so first up, palliative care is holistic in name, uh, but often not so in practice as well, right? So uh, I'm not a physician myself, so I can't really comment on uh, that the medical side of it. Uh, but if you do go to certain hospices in Singapore, I think every Friday they do have a little push cart that comes around with a can of beer for, for the patients. Uh, you know, they can, oh, you want Heineken, you want Guinness, you know. So uh, that, that does happen. So again, how do we reconcile this? Uh, again, I see it really comes down to whether or not patients are active participants. How, how much they view their patienthood, right? How much... Uh, they, they, they feel that this is what directs me, this is what drives me. Um, yeah, I think it really uh, is down to that unique, tailored, uh, therapeutic alliance they have with the medical team, right? So um, if you keep telling someone not to do it, so I've, 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 I've worked with uh, people who, who say, yeah, you know, my dad loves Coca-Cola, he keeps drinking Coca-Cola, he's so ill, we want him to stop, he doesn't want to do it, but you know, at the end of the day, what, what is it, who, what, I think it comes down to what is most important, all right, for them. Um, are you going to restrict ourselves and uh, completely cut off what we truly love as Singaporeans, which is food? Or are we just going to go ahead and eat that mee goreng and not worry about the calories or the kind of cholesterol that contains, you know? So again, it really depends on how you choose to live your life. Right. I think that autonomy, that patient autonomy is something that is very, very uh, important. So, so really I, I understand correctly, you're also um, saying that there's value not only in the, again, the consumption part, but it's, a lot of it is about memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, correct. Uh, yeah. As, as heritage. And, and this uh, uh, brings me to a comment from um, uh, Go Chui Ting. Uh, who uh, loves your presentation and says she wants to start a culinary recipe journal to document her grandmother's haka recipes. Oh, wonderful. And I guess this is the kind of um, uh, you know, family project that you hope mm -hmm. to see more of. Yes, yes, definitely, yeah. So uh, I think uh, everything can, all this kind of stuff can be done at a very uh, familiar level. Uh, but before that, I, I, I do want to go back very quickly to the idea of like, you know, taking away that, that kind of thing. So if there was someone who's a 90 year old man and he's like a, a, a heavy smoker, right? And smoking brings him all the joy in life. Uh, do we want to take, would you go and take away that cigarette from him and tell him to stop smoking? I mean, you know, he is going to die. He's at the end stage of his life. Uh, why do we want to take away? Why do we want to take away what makes him happy for his own good? So when does it become something? When does it become authoritarian, right? You know, um, yeah. So with regards to, to that, uh, with regards to uh, the, 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 the comments that we just received, uh, at a very familial level, creating all this stuff, like having that kind of legacy cookbook and uh, things like that, I think that it's such good practice with regards to uh, families, especially Asian families. I mean, uh, uh, it's very hard for us to say thank you. It's very hard for us to say I love you. I think that's the big one in Asia. Um, it's very hard for us to say, you know, I care about you. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, Kuma, the comedian, uh, always talked about his, his father bringing home packets of mee goreng and roti prata at 12 a.m. in the middle of the night and say, nah, eat. And that was his way of saying, yes, I love you, I care for you. So I think food is one of these ways. If you can sit down and instead of, you know, kind of like not say, oh yeah, I want to document your whole life, but okay, let's start in the kitchen. So tell me about this recipe. Uh, what is it that is so special about this recipe, Ma? You know, why, why do you always, who taught you how to do this? You know, and really having that, I think that can really fortify familial bonds, which are super, super important, especially when illness and infirmity hit, right? Um, who, who do we have left, right? For the people who care for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, there's a, there's a question from uh, Crystal Ong, who's a third year mm -hmm. psychology student. Uh, mm -hmm. She'll be doing her final year project next year okay. uh, mm -hmm. but I take it she's actually from your school so oh, okay. you know uh, she doesn't actually need this forum she uh -huh. could actually just look for you at NTU <laughs> <laughs> in, in any case <laughs> I, I will make sure uh, 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 Crystal please do have a personal face-to-face -face conversation uh, with Paul uh, 
for some reason, there's a generation that prefers things online rather than face to face. You know, I'm sure Paul, you're not yeah. one of them, and you would welcome a, a meeting. Crystal just stuff. send me an email, right? Uh, okay, good, excellent. Yeah. So, so Crystal <laughs> wants to know a little more about uh, how mm. you came up with those uh, themes. You know, what is the mm. the method behind it, so to speak? Okay, um, so like I did mention, uh, it is uh, constructivist. So really coming up, uh, you know, letting the data speak for itself. There's a lot of methodology. I'll, I'll probably spend another hour here <laughs> <laughs> explaining, <minute>. the <laughs> <laughs> explaining the cause, explaining the qualitative methods. But Crystal, email me. I'll send you a very important uh, bunch of articles that you can look at. You'll be much more clearer after that. Uh, my consultation slots, uh, I'll be at the highest. So if you want to meet me face to face, just come down. All right. Okay, Crystal. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, so, mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, uh, let me um, uh, draw this to an end so that, uh, you know, after this talk, I'm sure we all feel like dinner or supper or <laughs> anything else, hopefully with loved ones, uh, at least with loved ones in mind. Um, the, uh, uh, Paul, thank you so much for your, uh, your presentation. Uh, I think, you. Uh, you know, my own response is that, you know, aside from the um, the content you've uh, presented, I really want to to recognize your your research instincts. Yeah? You know, I love the fact that your agenda emerged uh, organically from your interviews, um, and I noticed that you know when you were welcoming everyone at the start of your talk, uh, you mentioned uh, members of the audience who are attending out of curiosity. Yeah? And I think that's so important and it's so revealing also about how you uh, view the research process, because I think, you know, having the time and the resources to follow our curiosity is one of the privileges of uh, an academic life. And I'm so glad that uh, you personally uh, see this value and are willing to highlight it and it's something that we all can learn from. Yeah? Uh, follow our curiosity. Um, so, so thank you so much, uh, Paul. Um, thank you also to um, NTU School of Social Sciences, first of all, for encouraging your research, but also for co-convening this uh, event. Uh, thank you to Professor Vinita Sinha as a discussant and all of you in the audience. Um, please do join us in two weeks time when um, uh, Joshua Babcock of the University of Chicago will talk about foreign bodies, uh, local languages. Uh, thanks everyone again and have a good evening. Thank Tonight. you. Thank you.